Yes, good morning everyone. Thank you all so much for watching in this morning. It's so lovely to have you here. Uh, do drop in that chat feature as so many people are already uh, where you're watching from. And we've got folks from Finland, from Australia, from Wales, Bristol, Liverpool, uh, Solly Hall, Devon, Sheffield. Uh, it's wicked to be sharing this experience with you. So thank you all so much for taking the time. Um, Welcome to the second session of season seven. I'm so pleased to have you here today. And as I was saying to our two speakers today, I'm just excited to see where this can go. Uh, this is one of those sessions where it's been a long overdue conversation for the marketing meetup. And so to actually spend the time uh, uh, focusing in on accessibility feels important. As ever, I will level two, level two challenges to everyone in this community today. The first is to keep that chat feature buzzing throughout the duration of today's session. Uh, I, I love every week seeing the, the contribution that comes from every one of you, uh, whether it's Sue, Denise, Melissa, Greg, Mark, Adam, Simon, whatever it may be, and whoever you may be, you spending time here is, is not only important for uh, the sense of community that comes from these sessions, but is also important uh, from the sense of contributing uh, everything that you like and enjoy from these sessions. Uh, to see a chat message that comes through and sort of says, I've actually learned something from this, uh, means the world both to myself and also to our speakers. So please do keep that chat feature buzzing throughout today's session. The second challenge I would level your way, uh, thank you Paul, uh, morning dreamboat. <laughs> uh, the second challenge I'd level your way uh, is that when you've got a takeaway from uh, today's session, please do drop on social media your biggest takeaway from that session. Uh, it, it makes the world a difference, it helps continue the conversation afterwards and it shares the learnings from these sessions which is so, so important particularly today. Uh, so if those two challenges sound good, uh, keeping that chat feature buzzing and also dropping on social media your biggest takeaway, then let's get going with today's introdu introductions. So today our guests are James Norris of Content Square and Sveta Dinova, who is the accessibility specialist at ASOS, which is pretty bloody wicked. Uh, today is one of those sessions that I think just feels important. Although I acknowledge I live in a bubble just like anyone else does, then accessibility is not a topic that has regularly reached the top of my list when it comes to marketing priorities. And I feel a little bit ashamed to be saying that out loud, but I think it is the truth and therefore it's one that needs to be acknowledged. However, when you combine the real sort of human uh, reality that a lack of accessibility provides, plus stats like 21% of people of working age in the UK uh, being considered disabled in the UK, then you have to acknowledge that this is something that deserves far more of our attention. And hopefully, um, hopefully today's session goes a little bit of that way to starting having a few more of these conversations. So that's why I'm so glad James and Sveta are here, two experts and two bloody good humans. Uh, today is a presentation, so uh, we'll, we'll be hearing from James and Sveta, uh, and then hopefully we'll have time for Q&A at the end too. It should be about 40 minutes and 20 minutes Q&A at the end, maybe a little bit less Q&A, we'll see. Uh, but in either case, do make sure to get those questions in uh, using the Q&A feature, which is found down below in your windows. So you'll see in your window right now that there's a, uh, a little thing at the bottom that sort of says Q&A. Uh, click in there and you can get your questions in and do make sure to get them in nice and early uh, so we can make sure we prioritize the best questions that come in. Uh, today's feature sponsor is Content Square, which is very apt for today, uh, not only because James is from there, but also because uh, they help uh, people improve their digital experiences through analytics uh, and a whole bunch of tools that enable you to understand how people are using your website and take it really to the next level of understanding how people experience your site and uh, ultimately how you can make it better for them. Uh, at the end of the day, as marketers, all we want to do is make it a better experience for our customers and the Content Square is exactly what that's about. Um, I also want to say a big thank you to our other sponsors, uh, to Impression, Attest, Hrefs, Redgate, Cambridge Marketing College, Brand Recruitment and Third Light. Um, I'll send a follow-up email after today's session with the human beings behind, uh, behind each of these brands. And if there's one ask I can make is that you say thank you to those human beings too. Uh, just for helping support this community. These events wouldn't happen if it wasn't for the support of these phenomenal 
brands and these phenomenal human beings behind them. If all that sounds good, uh, and with Jessica saying, accessibility is also not something prioritized, but here I am fighting it. Good for you, Jessica. And Helen saying, we're ready to update our website and excited to get some tips and making it say, more accessible. So it's so timely, then let's get going. And I'll pass over now to uh, James. Over to you, my friend. Amazing. Thank you so much, Joe. Let me share my screen quickly. <clears throat> so I'm a long time viewer, first time speaker. And <laughs> I've been watching the Matty Meetup now for over a year. And actually at Content Square, we have a dedicated slot in our diary every week for the whole team to watch. Um, so we've been fans for a long time and I'm really, really happy to be here talking about something that Sweater and I are super passionate about. So a quick introduction. Um, I am the Demand Generation Lead at Content Square. Um, I want to actually preface this chat by saying I'm not an accessibility expert, which might be a weird thing to say at the start of an accessibility talk, but what I am is a practitioning marketer, someone who's managed website projects in the past, and I've got years of experience as someone who is promoting change at big businesses, trying to drive transformation. And with accessibility, I feel we're at a stage now where we need to drive change on a more wholesale level to really see a difference, to really see a big impact and to drive movement. So I'm hoping to offer a different perspective today to try and look at the big picture around accessibility. And um, thankfully, I've got Svetta here as well, who is an accessibility expert and who can fill in the gaps in my accessibility knowledge with some practical tips to, to get you started. <clears throat> um, a quick fact about me before we carry on. I'm quite tall. Um, I mention it because it's probably the more interesting thing about me. It's the first thing people ask. I don't play basketball, in case you are wondering. Um, but you might not think of it as being a disability. It is absolutely not a disability. But it has accessibility impacts. If you've ever seen me try and sit in an easy jet flight seat or go under any door frame more than 100 years old, you'll see that little things can have big impacts over time. So that's how you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you, James. Hi, everyone. My name is Tveta, and I'm currently the accessibility lead at ASOS.com. I have been at my role for a couple of years now, um, and this is my first time at the marketing meetup, and I'm really, really excited to be talking about this really important topic. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and the fun fact about me is that I ride motorcycles, which is actually relevant today because um, unfortunately I had my kind of biggest to date um, knock on wood accident uh, a couple of months ago where I fell off my bike and I broke my collarbone which basically meant that for a couple of weeks I couldn't use my right arm um, I am right-handed so it was incredibly difficult to do my everyday job um, to use a laptop anything like that um and i kind of just like along the way it was a bit ironic you know the accessibility specialist who cannot kind of use websites and and do kind of basic tasks on an everyday level but it made me think um when we were preparing this presentation today that every one of you that has ever kind of broken a limb and has had to be in a cast or couldn't do something um, you know, for a certain amount of time, this is relevant to you as well. And it will be relevant to you each and every single time that this happens to you, because accessibility is not only about people with, you know, permanent conditions, it's for everyone. And it's about being inclusive to, you know, the specifics of your kind of everyday situation. And this is something that James will talk about a little bit later, but I just wanted to kind of start with that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Veta. That sounds really painful. It's those kind of stories that stop me being allowed to have a motorbike. Um, so maybe I won't share that one with my wife. <laughs> right. I want to start off today by taking you on a little journey. So this is an analogy that our content lead, Katie, came up with for an accessibility report we did recently. And it's a great one. So I want you to picture that you're super hungry. You've been going all day. You've not had any food. And you go to the restaurant, the only restaurant that's open now. And it's a soup restaurant. 
Now, I know what you're thinking. Soup isn't something you normally go to a restaurant for, or it's certainly not the only thing that a restaurant does, but just bear with me. In fact, I'm going to pretend that it's a ramen restaurant because ramen's my favorite food. So you go into the restaurant, you sit down, and the smells are hitting you, the flavors, you're getting excited. The waiter comes over and he brings your food. You look down and there's only chopsticks. Now, you're in a soup restaurant. Chopsticks? That's not going to work. Maybe you give it a go anyway, try and make a hash of it. It's not happening. It's not happening. At the end of the day, you can't eat soup with chopsticks. So how are you feeling at this point? Well, hungry, probably frustrated. Chances are you're not going to stay in that restaurant too long. Maybe you're going to complain. But the most important thing is that you didn't get your soup. So now you're hungry. Now, it's a bit of a, a bit of a funky analogy, but it's pretty apt, you know, in terms of trying to put ourselves in the shoes of people who are struggling with accessibility, it's good to think about, you know, what the impact would be on you in these scenarios. And at the end of the day, it's a blooming frustrating experience. So what is digital accessibility? I want you to stick a few thoughts in the chat. Tell me what you think digital accessibility is to you. Any volunteers? Inclusiveness, nice Joe. Yeah, a fair playground, I like that. Yeah, so there's a nice balance there between kind of moral arguments and technical arguments, equal access. All right, yeah, some nice ideas in there. So the kind of semi-formal definition of accessibility is designing and developing tools and technologies that anybody can use. So you can see here, it's not mentioning disability, it's not mentioning specific conditions, it's very much about creating a universal experience. And ultimately, we're trying to create content that allows users to perceive your content, to understand your content, to navigate around your content, to interact with your content, and also to contribute to your content or to contribute their thoughts and feelings. We categorize disabilities um, within four groups. And these are the ones that we consider most when looking at accessibility. So hearing is um, pretty clear. Um, deafness is the main thing here, but also there's a spectrum of hearing where you may be less able to hear. Um, visual is blindness, um, partial blindness, but also color blindness, which actually affects a lot of people, especially in the UK. Um, cognitive is around having greater difficulty with mental tasks. That could be something that's brought on by trauma, by a big moment in your life, or you could be born with it. And also motor, which is related to physical, um, physical disability or inability. Um, each one of these categories has different requirements, different, different um, considerations, but they're all super important to the, to the spectrum. And it's important to mention that, that disability is a spectrum. So I know what you were thinking at the beginning, James, height is definitely not a disability and you're absolutely right, but it does factor into accessibility. So to take this first example, for touch, you may have one arm, that is clearly a permanent and long lasting disability that's gonna have a major impact on your entire life. At the same time, you might be a new parent. So you've got a baby in your arm and you can't use your arm while you're holding that baby. So when we look at accessibility, it's not just the things that are obvious to us, which is how a lot of people think about this stuff. It's the obvious things like missing limbs or being stuck in a wheelchair, being deaf, but there's so much more behind the scenes to it, which is why it's difficult to wrap our heads around why it becomes so complex. But hopefully we can try and disseminate some of that today. So what I want to do is break down the argument and the case for accessibility in three categories. We've got the moral argument, the commercial argument, and the legal argument. From a moral perspective, I mean, this one should be fairly cut and dry, but let's see how we get on. 1.85 billion people have an impairment around the world. 1.85 billion. I had no idea about the scale of this problem until I started at Content Square and got speaking to people in the accessibility fields. But that's more than the population of China. Like when you put that context to the problem, you start to understand the scale and the challenge that 
that we're facing. And yet accessibility is still a, a minor part of the conversation when it comes to design and builds and strategy and all of that good stuff. But that's how a lot of people are affected. One in 25 people are visually impaired. So that's around three, two million people in the UK are registered as blind or partially blind. Around 340,000 are registered as colorblind as well, um, which equates to one in 12 people. One in 10 people have dyslexia. Um, so 6.3 million people in the UK have dyslexia. And one in 11 people are over the age of 65 plus. And obviously with age comes a greater exposure to some of the um, disabilities that we mentioned before. This group is actually growing super quickly as well. So by, 20, um, by 2050, I think the estimate is we'll have 20.6 million people in the UK over this age bracket compared to 12 million today. So this problem is only gonna get larger. And of those numbers, 80% of disabilities are actually invisible. So again, you don't always see the disability. We had this during COVID, right? Where we had people on trains not wearing masks. And the easy assumption is that they are just being annoying, that they don't want to take part, that they've got some kind of invalid excuse, but maybe they have respiratory issues. Maybe they have um, cognitive difficulties that mean they get anxiety or are too um, incapacitated through stress when they're wearing a mask. There's a lot of layers to this. Ultimately, from my perspective, one of the big problems I've seen with accessibility is that it often comes down to the numbers or it's a checkbox, ex checkbox exercise as part of design. And that's okay. You know, it's a good way to start and it's easy to quantify accessibility through that lens. But what it doesn't do is bring the humanity to the problem. And my feeling with accessibility and the reason that I've found it pretty easy to hook into this topic is that I can't think of many other topics that have a more human perspective. You know, we often speak about customer experience and user experience in design. Um, and it's all about creating a better experience, but it's not potentially life changing. This is potentially life changing. And even if it isn't, there's still a ton of people in the country and in the world that don't have the same level of access and, and experience as, as a non um, disabled person does. So we really need to stand in these people's shoes and try and understand what the impact is. So I've got a couple of examples here. We interviewed a few people as part of the accessibility report I mentioned earlier. And it was really interesting just to get a perspective from these people on some of the things that we really take for granted. So Maurice Matar is a product designer, an accessibility consultant, and he was born deaf. And Maurice said that chat functions on websites are like super critical to him being deaf. So when he needs information, he can't rely on calling a company. He can't rely on auditory information and chat functions actually give him a way to access that information quickly. But so often the chat functions are seen as a nice to have, not a need to have. And therefore that technology might not be fully baked. Maybe it relies on AI that's not very good at its job yet. And when he doesn't get the information he needs, he has to rely on a friend to, to call in and get that information for him. So even though he's a super articulate, super um, knowledgeable guy who's you know really leading in his field, he still has to rely on his friends to get information for him, which is a which is a dependency that he shouldn't have to have. Then we've got Daryl, who's an advertising consultant and a tech founder, and he has spinal muscular atrophy, which means that he struggles to interact physically with a lot of the things that we take for granted day to day. And for him, he really relies on, medi um, on medical, on mobile optimized websites because he, he relies on touch functionality to, to interact with technology. And he finds that um, an inaccessible site makes it hard for him to interact with his family, with his friends, but possibly even more importantly with digital services, especially public sector services where if he fails to take action, it can lead to a fine or, or even worse. So, you know, this is this is something that impacts him on a daily basis, but it can really impact on his ability to interact with with the things that he relies on on a daily basis. So the message is this, everyone deserves to live their best lives online because let's be honest, the internet's fucking great. Like it's one of the best things humans have created in my opinion for all of the problems, all of the challenges. 
it's it's really great. You know, it gives people access to the world of, of information. People in poor or rural, rural communities that don't have access to the world, they do now. Um, all people can can interact socially when before they they were stuck on their own. Cat videos, you know, there's so much good stuff on the internet, and everyone deserves to have an equal access to to live their best lives online. So hopefully that closes out the moral argument nicely. Um, now the commercial argument. So call me a cynic, but I don't believe that big change happens in business without a case, without a justification, without numbers to sit behind it. And I'm here with this perspective as someone who's worked with some of the biggest businesses in the UK to try and promote change. Change requires a case. So going back to that previous number, 1.85 billion people is a lot of people. That's a huge percentage of the audience globally that are going um, underserved, underutilized, and are not able to interact with your content. And that equates to $1.6 trillion of global spending power. Now, obviously, that's a global number. You'll have, you'll have your own regional figure, but it's fair to say there's a lot of cash on the table. And there's often debate around whether accessibility should even look at this stuff. But we have to be honest with ourselves. I would love for us to be able to solve this for pure morality, but I just don't think it's what shifts the needle. So it's worth considering these numbers, overlaying them against your own numbers and your own KPIs to understand what the gap is and what you're missing, because that's when you'll start to get your senior leadership really listening and your investors and whoever it might be. So I've got a quick um, question for you. How many home pages do you think have accessibility issues? Is it 63%, 71% or 96%? Stick it in the chat. All right. It's looking like quite a balanced response. I think C is probably leading out. It is C. 96% of homepages have accessibility issues. This figure actually, actually blew my mind. Um, now, this isn't that the homepage is fully inaccessible, it's that there are accessibility issues within that homepage, but it means that 96% of every homepage on the internet is gonna cause an issue for somebody. I'll just let that sink in for a second. <laughs> this is why we really need to try and solve this problem. And 71% of people that struggle with a website will leave that website or content, whatever it might be. So the fact is there are a lot of accessibility issues and they cause a lot of problem for a lot of people. And those people are going to vote with their feet. So if you manage to be the one that stands out, there's a big opportunity there. So go back to the soup analogy. Let's imagine that you leave that restaurant and you see a restaurant over the roads. It's a soup restaurant. Don't ask me why there's any soup restaurants in this city, but let's just run with it. You go over and they're like, yes, sir, of course you can have a spoon. Who would, who would not give you a spoon? Come in, come in. The chances are that's the restaurant you're gonna go back to again and again, right? And that's the point here. If you, to quote one of my favorite films, Bruce Almighty, if you be the miracle, if you put yourself forward and make the change, be a part of the movement, the fact is it's good for the optics. Again, being cynical, it is good for brands. And to quote Dave Gerhardt, brand equals reputation. If you make these changes, if you focus on the right areas, you will have a positive impact on the brand. And in a world where we focus on things like diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, the old school corporate social responsibility, there are clear benefits beyond just the financial to the business. So definitely factor these in when you think about building the case for accessibility beyond just the basics. <clears throat> so quickly on the legal argument, there are laws across the world. They're a bit useless at the moment. They're in place, but not much action is happening on the back of them. But we said this about data and GDPR as well. So it was super loose. And now it's not super loose. When GDPR came in, people panicked, spent money left, right and center, used all of their resources for months. So my call here is to get ahead of it. A stitch in time saves nine. Great old Chinese proverb, I think. Um, spend the time now, factor it into your website redesigns, factor it into your content builds, and you'll be saving yourself a lot of headache in the future because this will become more of a legal challenge. 
So I mentioned before, I think that we need to inspire change to really start building momentum around this rather than relying on, on a few superheroes. Um, Tim Berners-Lee famously said that the power of the web is in its universality and that access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. I think this is really important. So it's about universality, not just focusing in on specific things. And at the moment, I feel like accessibility is very much a grassroots movement. It's a few heroes and champions in a business trying to make a difference. And that's awesome. And um, to quote Max Hoppy's dad on a post from James the other day, nothing great is achieved without enthusiasm. So we have to start somewhere. And it's been amazing personally to see some of the heroes making a difference in this space. But universality requires a holistic approach. You know, we talk about the customer experience, it's end to end. Every single touch point that a person has with your business is a potential tripping point for accessibility. So really you need to bring together different people, different disparate groups in the business to focus on accessibility together. So three quick tips on how to inspire change. First of all, get to know your disabled audience. This is a super emotive, super um, passionate topic for a lot of people. If you speak to your audience, you'll soon realize some of the challenges that they're facing, but you can also share that with the business and try and inspire change uh, through empathy. So interview people, try and capture their, um, their stories and then share those stories with your business and, and maybe even wider. Um, that's the quick win from a big win perspective. Um, Personas and journey maps, we all know about these, but I've often used them in my consulting life to try to inspire change, but also to try and knock down silos. So it's a great way to try and bring teams together to focus on a common challenge and to build a journey with empathy that kind of highlights the gaps in your experience when it comes to accessibility. So rather than doing this just on personas like you know, the, the single mum, like focusing on disabilities, on accessibility um, audiences to really map out what this means in practicality. So I mentioned before, change requires a business case. So quick win is to just quantify your metrics against the accessibility figures to try and understand what impact it could be having on your business and then show the business what you could be missing. From a big win perspective, um, a fully fledged business case, certainly if you're looking at kind of a website replatforming or a content square, we're doing a platform, a complete platform redesign for accessibility that costs a lot of money. So <clears throat> building a business case that balances performance and efficiency metrics are going to help you to build that case for investment. And then create accessibility advocates. Again, people get passionate about this. Like there's so many people now in content square speaking and advocating for accessibility. So use that momentum, use that energy to try and create advocates that are going to help make this part of the culture of the business. Because when you change the culture, that's when this kind of thing sticks. So run internal enablement sessions. Feel free to steal this deck. I don't mind. Ask me if you need any more info. And also try and build knowledge bases for every function in the business so that they understand how to make your specific business more accessible. And then the big one would be to look at starting an accessibility squad, you know, create some accountability, a group that can really try and drive the agenda, but also make differences around the business, um, try and pull some leaders in there as well. And then one neat idea I've seen is to run accessibility awards to really celebrate success in this field, try and call out hero stories and examples of where changes has made an impact on people. Um, basically just make this stuff more visible because if it's visible, people will buy in. And that is me. So hopefully that's been a good rally call. And now Sveta is going to take you through some practical ways to get started on accessibility today. Thank you so much, James. Okay, so a few practical tips on how to make your digital content more inclusive. This is definitely a non-exhaustive list, but if you're wondering where to start, you leave the session and you want to kind of start working on something. I have distilled a couple of things into six different points. So I'm gonna quickly take you through them with some examples and who does it affect. So first point. Thank you, James. Um, remove distractions. What do I mean by remove distractions? So um, a couple of things here, the first one being, avoid unnecessary animations. Um, it's very difficult to argue which animations are 
unnecessary. Um, but you have to consider that there is a, a huge group of users with various conditions. So whether that would be a cognitive or a visual impairment who might struggle with content that, you know, moves a lot with kind of a, a lot of animations and things kind of flying around. These users um, very often use the reduced motion setting on their devices. This is now available to everyone. All devices have this setting, no matter if they're um, kind of an Apple or a Microsoft device or anything else. Um, so you have to consider these users and you have to kind of ask yourself, you know, what would my content look like without this animation? Would it still be, um, you know, relevant? Because there might be users out there who are have this setting on and they might actually see the content without the animations. And if the answer is, you know, the animation doesn't really bring much value, then you might want to consider removing it. Uh, moving on to the next point, which is again related to kind of unnecessary movements on the page. Um, do not ever autoplay videos that you have on your pages. Um, now, I have an example here from the MNS homepage. You will see this a lot more now on different brand pages where um, kind of their main hero image um, or their main kind of hero banner has a pause button and a lot of them won't be using videos these days. The reason being that even if they are auto-playing content, so for example, this banner kind of auto-changes the minute you land on the page, you should give users the ability to pause this content because it might make them sick, it might make them uncomfortable if they are low vision and they're already confused about the page structure, but basically never have videos auto-playing, give the user the ability to uh, play the content for themselves when they choose to, when they are ready. Um, and the last point is also um, related to kind of uh, moving content. And it is about um, not having flashing content. There is a specific criteria here. So your content should never flash um, above uh, kind of three times per, per second. Um, the reason for this is that it might actually make someone it might actually kill someone who has a photosensitive epilepsy. It might also make them really sick. The same counts for you know people with specific cognitive conditions who might struggle with content kind of like being a lot in their face. Um, and the reason why I have a Pokemon picture here is because in the 90s, um, the reason kind of this whole movement with flashing content started was um, there was an episode of Pokemon that was shown on Japanese TV where um, there was a very strong, very quick flash between red and blue, um, which actually triggered um, epilepsy in about, I think, 60 kids who had to go to hospital. And that just went on the national news and it became such a big thing that, you know, slowly it kind of started um, creeping into other content so that if you've noticed, for example, um, in the late 90s, early 90s um, on TV, when there was content with like strobe lights or any kind of flashing, there was always a warning beforehand. And all of that stems from um, kind of this, this case basically, and people realizing that this content is not good um, if you're epileptic. Um, so moving on, um, use plain language. There seems to be an issue with the image here, but I think that was just decorative anyway. So using plain language, what do we mean by that? First of all, check your reading level. If you are putting together um, content in the form of text, always use, um, there are so many out there, but I would recommend the Hemingway editor. Um, it's free, it's online. You just have to kind of copy and paste your content on there. And it ultimately kind of gives you the reading level and it highlights different things that you can change in the text. So this um, text I copy pasted from the um, World Health Organization report on disability, um, and this is kind of their intro. So it is a bit ironic that this text seems to be at postgraduate reading level, which is way too high. You can see underneath that it says aim for um, kind of about the age of 14. You want to have a very kind of low reading level. You want to have it accessible to everyone. You don't want to use complicated sentences. Um, or, you know, adverbs, but these kinds of editors will give you a lot of tips on how to improve your content. So it's definitely worth checking them out. Um, next up is about explaining abbreviations, um, which is kind of relates to the first point as well. But basically, if you're ever using 
specific abbreviations related to something you know more technical for example in your content make sure that the first time around you define and explain those abbreviations if you're using a lot of those um, just have a little section in your content that basically just lists all the abbreviations and explains them this is good you know for people with cognitive conditions but it's also good for everyone we're not supposed to kind of know all of these abbreviations and um, you know, have to remember them. So it's definitely a good thing to consider. And then finally, um, label everything clearly, um, which is basically consider, are your labels good enough? Can you make them even more, um, you know, straight to the point so that the user knows when they click on this button, when they click on this link, where are they going to go? Always label all of your inputs very clearly as well. Make sure you provide instructions, things like that. I mean, that affects users with cognitive um, conditions, but it also kind of affects everyone in general. You know, you might be low vision, you might be, um, you know, you might have a motor impairment, um, in which case, for example, you might be using voice control to control your device. And in that case, you want to have very clear labels and you want those labels to be associated with um, the respective inputs. I'll talk about that a little bit later. So moving on to the next point, always use captions. Um, you want your cat videos to be accessible. Every single video content anywhere should have captions. Um, I hope you already know this affects obviously users with um, who are hard of hearing or deaf, um, but it also affects everyone these days. I mean, there was um, this statistic about you know, how much um, content that has captions actually improves engagement because all of us are on our phones nowadays in the tube. Um, you know, we don't always have headphones on. It's good for everyone to have captions. But also, um, next point, do not forget your um, social media content because a lot of the times, you know, I see people putting a lot of effort into creating captions for videos that go on their website. And then for everything that goes on their social media, you know, it's kind of um, not so consistent. So all platforms now allow you to um, have auto-generated captions. Please just use that. It's for everyone's benefit, but particularly for users, um, you know, who have um, hearing impairments. And then lastly, provide transcripts for audio. Um, that could be, you know, any kind of audio, but for example, uh, podcast recordings. It's really, really good, again, for users who are hard of hearing. They won't have any other way of accessing this con content, but it's also really good for, um, you know, for anyone who just wants to kind of go and revisit the content afterwards, find a specific part of it. Someone with, you know, a cognitive condition um, as well, who, you know, might be a bit slower in processing information and they just want to kind of follow the transcript while they're also listening to the audio. So this is super, super valuable. Always make sure you do that. And again, there are automated kind of transcripting um, uh, services online. So it's not that difficult to kind of um, create this content. Okay, moving on. Describe content for screen reader users. So. A quick note here, um, screen reader users, what do I mean by that? So we're talking about users who are low vision um, or fully blind, who rely on a screen reader device to read back information at them. And the reason for this is um, basically they need the content rendered in a different way because they're not able to see, they're not able to interact visually with the content. So I have a very quick demo of what a screen reader looks like. I think, James, you might have to unmute yourself because the sound is very important here for this, so for this yeah. video. I'm gonna try. Yeah, let's see. Stories. BBC News, menu, button. Top stories, edit. France so this is basically Ticket. just me Radio. going through Laura. Button. Adult. BBC Elvin. News. Atajazi, Gendarmerie, Gendarmerie. EU countries and struggle with the Russian oil ban. Europe. Budget pasta prices jump 50% as food staples rise. This kind video of going through the different uh, articles and trying to pick something, something to open. Who tracks down her own stone car before police? Energy costs threaten swimming pools. Officials warn. UK. Button. Energy costs. Top stories. Back button. Share. Button. 
Children from Lambeth Borough, London, during a swimming lesson. Image, pool, swimming. So pay Peer attention media. to the way the image is described media. as well. Swimming pools across the UK are struggling with rising energy costs. Energy cost rises threaten swimming pools. Officials warn. Heading, 59 minutes ago. UK, link. Swimming pools across the UK are at risk of closure as energy costs are rising. Industry officials have warned. Okay. Keeping the water can change, continue. You can change the slide now. Thank you so much. So... I just wanted to quickly show you this for those of you who don't have any context around kind of what is it like to use a screen reader, but imagine not being able to see the screen and having to follow this content. So the BBC is, they're really, really good with how they structured their content with their accessibility in general, which is why I wanted to show you this. Um, but there's a couple of things that I sort of want to um, highlight here when we're making content accessible for screen reader users. So for users who are low vision um, or blind and are kind of relying on a screen reader to access things. So the first thing is um, use visible labels where possible. Why I'm saying visible labels, because oftentimes when we focus on making content accessible for screen reader users, we start thinking, oh, should I kind of add some uh, additional text here just to kind of make a clarification specifically for screen reader users? And I'm going to hide this text because obviously they, they're not going to be able to see the page a lot of the time. So I'm just going to do it like a uh, hidden text. No, because the reality is with accessibility, you want the experience to be the same for everyone. So if you are tempted to add additional content just for a specific user group, that means you need to reconsider your whole kind of page design and the design of your content because you want those clarifications to be there for everyone, not just for someone who is using a screen reader. Very few cases you will need additional kind of hints for screen reader users, but in general, just try to make the content visible in a way that would also benefit someone who cannot see the content. So use visible labels um, and basically, yeah, just have them on the page so that they're also announced to someone who can't see the page. I've given a very common example here. A lot of the times when we're given um, a, a kind of um, a date input uh, of sorts, we're always kind of told to, you know, just give a enter the date, enter your birthday or whatever. And the individual fields are often not marked with, you know, this is the day field and this is the month field and this is the year field. This is such a common mistake. Um, and it's a really good example of, you know, you want to mark these fields, each individual one, so that the user, when they land on it, they know, okay, this field is for the day and this one is for the month and they're not kind of um, confused or, you know, have to go back and forth and try to read the instructions. The Gov UK website is always a really, really good source of um, inspiration, especially if you're doing forms. Um, so that's a very good tip. Next up is uh, when we're talking about these labels, always associate them with the inputs. Um, so that's a bit of, more of a kind of a techie thing, but always make sure that within the codes, the labels and the fields are associated. So again, for a screen reader user, um, they will know the connection between those two things. But also, again, if I am um, for example, a user who's bound in a wheelchair and I am interacting with my content using my voice, I might go day input, expecting, you know, to start kind of typing in information in that um, specific field. And if the labels are not associated, I'm not going to be able to go there that way. So very important. Next up is um, making sure the errors are well communicated. Again, we're doing all of this to make sure that users don't make any errors, but oftentimes they will. And we want to make it as quick um, as possible for them to understand where the error is, correct the error and move on. So basically always have a very clear error message, always have the error message again, associated with the respective field so that they know where the error occurred. Um, and yeah, it's just one of those kind of like key things, especially when we're talking about forms. And lastly, um, give your images alternative text. So I don't know if you noticed, but on the BBC um, kind of example with the screen reader, the images were described. So when the screen reader landed on the image of the kids swimming, it said, you know, kids swimming in um, whatever borough it was in a swimming pool. So it's so, so important to give your images alternative text in any circumstances. If the image is um, 
decorative, if it's purely decorative, then the old text can be empty. If it's non-decorative and it's actually valuable for the rest of your content, always make sure that there is a description on there. I have linked a really good um, article on here about um, kind of the use of alt text within SEO, which I'm sure a lot of you would be interested in. Um, it's a really, really good article because it also describes how to create good alt text, um, which is really important. So I'll make sure that that is um, sent over to you because it's a really good article to have in mind. Five is make sure all content is accessible via the keyboards. What does that mean? Um, so when we land on a page, we have something called the focus order. Um, it is the order in which if you're purely just using your keyboard um, and you're moving through the page using the tab key, that would be the order that the elements would, um, that you would be able to access the elements. Always make sure that the focus order is the same as the visible order. So basically I would expect in an um, English um, kind of based website that the focus order is top to bottom, left to right. So I'm moving this way on the page um, and you can check that using various kind of different tools. I have a screenshot here of um, where I've checked the focus order um, of YouTube, just making sure that, you know, you can see kind of little numbers on there that point you to the different interactive elements. So making sure that that focus order is correct and it's moving in the right direction. Um, next point is about um, not only ensuring that that focus order is um, correct, but also ensuring that you can interact with every element on the page. James, can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so making sure that you know each and every one of these elements, you're able to tap to it, it's in the correct order, but also you are able to you know, click on the buttons, click on the links, everything opens. You can move through the journey by purely using the keyboard. This is critical for anyone who might have a motor disability. You know, that might be in the form of not being able to use a trackpad, not being able to use a mouse, having a tremor, or in general, just, you know, not being able to kind of interact with, you know, their um, device whatsoever. Um, a lot of assistive technologies are mapped onto a keyboard. It means that it's like pressing different buttons. So you want to make sure that, um, you know, using a keyboard is kind of possible on your content. And it's very, very easy to test that. You're just kind of using the keyboard to tab through different things, press enter where you need to, trigger different actions, buttons and, um, and links and so on. And lastly, the final point here um, is ensuring that the focus outline is always visible because we're so used to using trackpads and, 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 uh, and a mouse or just using a touch screen nowadays that we don't think about, you know, if I'm tabbing through a page, I need to know where I am at every kind of single point. Again, GovUK are a really, really good example of the way that they super strongly highlight the content um, and you know um, at every point where you are on the page. You don't have to do it that way. You can just use um, kind of the browser um, uh, defined focus outline, but there has to be a focus outline. Otherwise, it's very, very difficult to find where you are on the page. And my last point, I believe, is number six here check your colors and have good contrast. Um, so this is um, a lot about users with kind of specific um, visual conditions. We're talking about testing your designs using a color blindness simulator. This is so, so easy to do nowadays. You can have a browser plugin. You can, you know, just Google kind of a blindness simulate, a color blindness simulator and run your designs through it. You can run designs, you can do live pages, anything you want. But it's very important if you are using a lot of color and you're using color to communicate things, then you have to kind of just double check everything. A lot of the times because the content will change a lot when you're kind of mimicking these different conditions, but also because um, for some users, colors such as, for example, um, red and green might look so, so similar that the contrast might ultimately fall, fall a lot less than what you were initially expecting. Um, so it's important to kind of make sure that all of your 
content is contrasting sufficiently. And on that note, the next point is about contrast. Um, it's very important to have good contrast across. What I mean by that is when we're talking about text, a lot of the times we want to have at least 4.5 to one contrast for text. Um, for reference, contrast between black and white is 21. So 4.5 to one um, is oftentimes not even that strong. I have a, a little example here on the side of kind of different colors and how they contrast with each other. There are contrast checkers online that you can use. Again, it's very, very simple. You can have plugins for Figma, for example, and for a lot of other um, kind of editing softwares where you just instantly check contrast. So try to have 4.5 um, to one for text and three to one for UI comp components. So for anything like icons and things like that. And what I would advise here as well is if you have, um, for example, brand colors or colors that you use very often, try to have those um, map them onto kind of a single page, understand how they contrast with each other and what you can and cannot use, and just have that map as a reference point for yourself, for everyone on the team, um, you know, so that you don't have to go and check those colors each and every time you have it on there already. Final point, um, do not use color as the sole means um, to communicate information. Um, this very often appears in things like graphs um, and stuff like that. So if you look at the, the graphs that I have as an example, the first one uses color um, as the, the sole means to communicate information, whereas the second graph at the bottom um, also uses a pattern on, on each of the graphs. So if we move on to um, the next page, yes, thank you, James. Um, you can see now that if you, um, were potentially, for example, colorblind, or if you are in a situation where you couldn't render colors very well, for example, we had a really old monitor or something like that, then it's actually really beneficial to have the pattern as well as the color to communicate information so that you know that every user who comes across this graph is able to um, perceive the information. Okay, and those were my tips. Um, now, I just want to say a couple of things. If you want to dig a bit deeper into accessibility, um, I have three main tips for you. Check out WCAG, um, which stands for, which is basically the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, check the level 2.1 AA. That is what you want to um, adhere to if you were kind of like really serious about making your content accessible. That is usually kind of the legal guideline. Um, so it's really, really good to look at, um, there are 50 guidelines within WCAG 2.1 AA, um, and you can kind of use them as checkpoints for your content. Start learning how to test with assistive, assistive technologies. So I did a very quick demo today of how a screen reader works, but we all have them available on our devices. And it's very, very good to start teaching yourself kind of how to use them. There's so much content online. Um, just go on YouTube and, and you know, uh, browse like different videos on assistive technology and screen readers. And it would be really valuable for you to start kind of understanding how that works. And finally, James already made this point, but talk to your users, you know, find real life users of your content that have different needs that are possibly using different assistive technology. Talk to them. They are the people that you're doing this for and they can give you the best possible feedback in this situation. Amazing. That's it. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. So, um, we've mentioned it in the chat. We've got a ton of stuff that we can share with you, but we'll share it um, through Joe after the session or you can check out on LinkedIn. And we'll share it there as well as a post. Um, but hopefully that's given you lots of food for thought. Um, and Joe, do you think we can answer a couple of Q&A questions before we head off? Well, just 100%. No, I, I, I love that. Thank you very, very much, both of you. Like, I, I think there's uh, everyone who's been watching in today is, is taking an awful lot from that, both from an informational point of view. But uh, there's this last, ch last chat comment that comes in from Ruth, who said, last night I was thinking, have I got time for this today? Now I'm thinking, how can I not prioritize this, um, which is really, really wicked. So, um, you know, thank you and congratulations to both of you for putting together such a phenomenal presentation that was both 
informative and useful and I think provided a real compelling argument for uh, exactly as Ruth says, uh, thinking, how can I not prioritise this? So thank you uh, both sincerely. I, I think that was really, really brilliant. Um, let's get into some questions, as you say, um, because we've only got a few minutes left just as I go out of focus. Uh, so the first one uh, is from Anonymous, who says, I really struggle with alt text and knowing if I'm writing the right thing. Uh, how descriptive should it be? So I love, by the way, that that distinction that you made that like, I didn't know about, you didn't need to put alt text in if it was just decorative, that even in that, that that was really useful. But when you're, when you are doing alt text, how descriptive do you need to be with it? It's your choice. And I think it's personal preference in general. If you are speaking to users, you will notice that some users um, some screen reader users prefer really, really descriptive text. Others are like, I'm not even interested in images. It's up to you. I love that the BBC um, have a rule, which is whoever chose to put this image on there should create the old text. You don't necessarily need to worry about how descriptive you are. Try to keep it, you know, as short as possible, but give as much information as you can. Do check out, um, I guess we'll we'll find a way to share this um, article that I was talking about um, earlier, there is a really kind of good guide on there on how descriptive you need to be with old text. So hopefully that will help you. But um, just try to communicate the important things on the image, I would say, you know, whether that is um, who's on the image or what they're doing or their facial expression, or, you know, if it's some sort of data, always, always have old text for images that have text embedded in them, which is wrong in the first place. Try to not embed text into images, but if the text is already on there, it's very important to communicate that and also to communicate what else is kind of roughly on the image, I would say. But don't worry too much about how in depth you go. Just try to kind of make it right from your perspective about what you're trying to communicate across. Nice. I love that. There's there's some uh, interesting chat going on in, in the chat feature earlier on with with Amber, uh, who was attending the event and, and sort of said that one of the lines Amber said at the end of the chat comment was like, uh, people having subtitles and actually making the effort to correct subtitles to be the correct word rather than sort of like a version of which has been auto generated shows that they've made the effort on accessibility and even that alone is enough to sort of make a feel seen um and and like that that theory of sort of like being seen i think seems to be going a long way as well as sort of the the very practical sort of uh, element of um you know just getting it quote unquote right uh, it, it it seems um you know and even though we should of course be aiming to get it right so really interesting um we'll move on to the next question because it comes from simon and I, I think it was the one that i had too which was like as i was listening through i was like bloody hell all this looks great and as, as an example with the keyboard and, and sort of moving through then um to be able to sort of define <laughs> even where the tab goes uh using the tab on the keyboard to go to the next thing i was like that looks great how do i do that on my website and I know that Content Square have like a bunch of resources and, and, and stuff like that. But I mean, do you have like, is there a bunch of recommended tools and plugins and, and stuff like that that people can use online to sort of implement these accessibility features? Or is it uh, quite a customized experience that everyone sort of has to go through by themselves on, on their respective websites? So I, uh, there's definitely a list of tools that I can send you joe that you can then kind of send to everyone um, instead of kind of listing them right now they're really really valuable tools but they're mostly for checking um, kind of post factum so what i would suggest when it comes to focus order when it comes to a lot of these things is um you know if we're talking about uh web pages just use semantic components because they already have everything embedded in them don't try to change and force things. Don't. So the, the whole point about focus is don't try to force the focus somewhere where it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. If you just let the focus flow through the semantic components, that is the best way to go about things because it just means you're not kind of um, trying to do some custom, you know, kind of interesting things that might actually confuse the user who's not able to see the page. So this is kind of my biggest suggestion and I'm definitely up for putting together um, a, a list of, of things that I use every day 
um, and they're all kind of free. You can just um, walk them onto your browser and test different things. Um, so happy to provide a list that you can send to everyone afterwards. That would be really great and appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, sorry, James. I was just going to say from my perspective as well as a non-techie, I think, first of all, empathize with your specific user base because everyone's audience is different. Have a think about what is going to affect your, your group of individuals the most and then try and try and prioritize the things that you can do by by balancing effort versus impact to try and set a set a bit of a roadmap for change because there's a ton that you can change obviously the stuff that is easy to do um, is a good place to start but there are things with maybe a bit more effort will have a really huge impact so it's good to just try and take a step back have a think about what you're trying to achieve and who you're trying to achieve it for yeah i love that thank you mate you, you you're spot on and it's it's one of these things that there's you know such a, a vast array of exactly as you described earlier on you know of, of problems to overcome and and so to actually um be working towards that seems really important and, and in lots and lots of different ways so thank you um we've got a question from pearl who asks uh, i facilitate workshops for big groups so 100 to 200 people online and offline uh, any tips bringing accessibility into the way we design and facilitate our programs so i mean like in a way, this is a lot of what we've been focusing on today in, in general, but uh, are there any uh, specific uh, examples that might be useful for Pearl uh, beyond what we've spoken about today? Yeah, definitely. So one thing I do for our teams is I run personas workshop. So James um, kind of briefly mentioned about this earlier, but there are some really good um, personas uh, that come from the Gov UK website. Um, so these are personas with specific um, disabilities that you can use to test content. Obviously, do not rely 100% on this, but it's really, really good for awareness. Um, I run the sessions all the time and people always come out of them kind of being like, oh, I had no idea. Um, again, I can include a link because you have all the information. I mean, if you Google accessibility personas, Gov UK, I think they will come up. Um, but they have everything, um, kind of all the information on there for setup, for what you're looking at, um, how to kind of mimic different conditions on your device as well. So that is definitely such a good starting point. Um, I would recommend it for sure. And I can, again, send you a link, Joe, so you can send it to everyone. That's okay. incredible. This follow-up email is going to be so useful. <laughs> yeah. I, just quickly as well, another good way to structure these kind of workshops is to use design thinking. So design thinking is is a means of trying to get to a solution by thinking about your audience, defining your requirements, and then ideations to try and get to a result. But if you use that um, and start with the with the um, empathizing to really focus in on on these kind of users and to create universality. That's a really nice way to structure people's thoughts and kind of inspire um, imagination as well. Wicked, right, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Um, just going through the remainder of the the questions in the Q and A, that it seems like there's quite a few that are uh repeats of, of of what's come through already or um or versions of of what's been spoken about in the presentation so i'm probably going to close things out there and say honestly that was one of my favorite sessions that we've ever ever done uh, with the marketing meetup um so useful and informative and I, I genuinely think that anyone watching them today is probably uh going to be taking a long hard look at their website today and, and sort of going what can we do to to make things better, um, which feels like an impactful and useful um, thing to do. So uh, James Sveta, thank you very, very much. Um, really, really appreciate it. And uh, thank you also to everyone in, in the chat as well for such thoughtful uh, conversation and, and, and being so helpful to one another as well. I, I really love to see people uh, being so supportive as ever. It's really, really useful and uh, just amazing to be part of. Um, this session will be written up um, both in, on the blog post and in our uh, newsletter afterwards. Uh, and we'll look to include the tools in there, which will be uh, really useful as well. So all for me to say is thank you so much to James Sveta for taking the time for putting that together. As Fionn says, a truly impactful session, amazing speakers. Thank you so much. Uh, please do take the time to thank our sponsors um, because it makes the world a difference. 
and we'll be back next Tuesday with a very different session all about copywriting uh, next Tuesday at two o'clock and uh, that's all so have a great day everyone and thank you so much for tuning in take care everyone and uh, lots of love thank you